Before we get started with the show, uh, Sydney and I are going to be talking a little bit about some plans that we follow in terms of our running and our preparation for, uh, for me right now it's half marathons. Uh, maybe I'll do a marathon at the end of the year and uh, she just did the, the marathon up in Duluth. And one thing that we kind of stick to are plans that are tried and true that have allowed other people to do something that is difficult like a marathon and to you know tailor their preparation around their work and uh, if you go to the pre-residency audio academy re residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash pre-residency uh, i have those you know kind of 12 or 13 different things that you really want to look at as you're kind of going down your residency journey uh, from you know talking about the residency application to letters of intent cvs uh, letters of recommendation uh, mid-year uh, right now the the current advice is that the preference is for the individual meetings with the residency sites rather than meeting them at mid-year uh, although you know mid-year can be valuable um, some insider tips so actually interviewing rpds and then interviewing current residents uh, are also in there as well uh, how i rank residency programs i think it's a little bit tough to figure out like which one is best for you uh, a little bit about phase two and then you know once you get out of PGY1 or PGY2 you want to have a clinical career cover letter uh, prepare for board certification and then make sure you're mindful with your your finances and things like that so again this is another one of those less stressed pharmacist episodes where uh, we're talking about something that may seem like it's outside of pharmacy but your ability to pair health within your own life and for Sydney and I uh, one of the big parts of our lives is is running uh, then it really makes it a lot easier for you to manage the challenges that you're going to have uh, but it's you know great to have a fellow runner fellow marathoner uh, on and um, you know I know she's gonna do great but things like this uh, or if you're maybe a d1 d2 d3 athlete you think, okay, what is it about my pharmacy career that I need to show the residency admissions or even the employer that you're going to go to? But really just saying that I'm a marathoner in a couple words just basically says, oh, you're someone that can do something hard and somebody that can uh, go the distance and that you're not used to hard work, that you're not you know, afraid of hard work and that you are ready to take on a challenge. And so without further ado, here is Sydney Day. Uh, who is from the University of Iowa and getting in her second appy and we're going to be uh, talking about the marathon and how it kind of uh, relates to not only the residency process but uh, the importance of being fit in life. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm here with Sydney Day from the University of Iowa uh, who is just starting her second Appy, and uh, we wanted to actually talk first about the marathon. We're both runners, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how the marathon kind of compares a little bit to uh, going through pharmacy school, undergrad, uh, then certainly professional school, and then finally getting into uh, residency. So, Sydney, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Thank you, Tony, for having me today. Okay. All right. Well, first, if you could tell them a little bit about yourself and maybe a little bit about the uh, your background uh, in athletics or sports. Um, we have had a P3 on who was like super big into athletic training, um, Keaton Higgins, but uh, I don't know that you've gotten any certifications like ATC or anything like that, right? So uh, tell me a little bit about your running. Are you a casual runner? Did you uh, run in undergrad? Uh, we do sometimes every once in a while have somebody who is a D1 athlete. So I do did run during undergrad. I started running half marathons with a friend of mine, and we continued and decided to run a full marathon to push ourselves to that extra limit. And so I've ran three different marathons now. I've ran the Quad Cities Marathon, I've ran the Des Moines Marathon, and now the Grandma's Marathon, and I've ran a few halves, the Cedar Rapids Half Marathon, as well as the Iowa City Marathon and a few others. And that marathons always give me a good challenge and push me a little farther than the typical half marathon. And I really enjoy running and enjoy running every day. And it helps me stay sane. <laughs> so that is one of the things that we kind of talk about all the time. We talk about pharmacy burnout. We talk about work-life balance. But 
uh, I have, you know, three 10-year-olds, so, uh, you know, finding time seems to be one of the, the toughest things uh, to do. Uh, I use Hal Higdon when uh, I go for the marathon. Right now I'm just in um, half marathon training, so I can just pull off a Saturday or Sunday where maybe I go for two hours or, you know, 150 minutes, something like that. Uh, but tell us a little bit about how you fit running into pharmacy school, and then now that well, you're not homeless, but in general, Appy students are somewhat homeless, or they're they're uprooted at least. Uh, tell me how you fit working out into your life. So I schedule my life using a planner. I use a training plan for marathon training. So I had a set mile, set number of miles that I wanted to run each day, and with those certain mile markers that I wanted to reach, training for the marathon as well as the busy work life of having appies, I try to plan and make sure that I had my priorities together, that I was able to complete my coursework and still do well in school, and then make time for running. I ran probably anywhere from three to five times a week, depending on the schedule and how I was feeling, and tried to, tried to do my best in managing it all. Well, tell me a little bit about your actual plan. So tell me, do you, uh, you said you, you pick a number of miles. Are you picking a certain volume for the week? For example, Hal Higdon says, if you're going to run 20 miles on Sunday, then it would look something like this. It would be uh, off or cross-train Monday, then 5 miles on Tuesday, 10 miles on Wednesday, 5 miles on Thursday, off on Friday, 10 on Saturday, 20 on Sunday. That's what like a Hal Higdon would be. And then, you know, when you're only at 12 or 13 miles, you just have that kind of volume where, you know, the, the weekend kind of equals something in the middle of the week. Uh, what were you doing in terms of volume on a, on a daily basis? Because you're not a slow runner. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I was doing is I run anywhere from 8 to 10 miles a day. Some training plans do say to run 5 or 6 miles in between, but I also would do a longer run, so I would do a 15 to 17 mile run a week on top of that, and we used a three-month training plan, and we used a training plan that was considered a intermediate to a more developed runner training plan to prep for the marathon. And that seemed to be helpful. The longer runs for me are something that I enjoy, but I do struggle once they get up to that closer to the 20 to 22 mile range. Yeah. The train lane. Yeah. And I, I know some people think we're just crazy to just turn this, this podcast episode off, but uh, tell me a little bit about how you developed up to that because. I started with a very terrible 5K. I mean, the, the middle schooler 5K where I basically sprinted the first mile as fast as I could go, started dying in the second mile, and then I watched a Boy Scout troop waiting for their slowest runner run past me at the end. I was dead last in my age group. Uh, I was almost dead last in the entire race. And that was my first experience because I didn't know anything about splitting up mileage like okay if it takes you 30 minutes then it shouldn't go 8 9 13 it should go 10 10 10 or something like that um, how did you learn to become a runner unless maybe it's just intuitive for you so I did do cross country in middle school and high school and that kind of inspired my running career and in college I didn't run professionally, but I did still continue to run and started to run anywhere from five to seven miles to help with the stress and burden of school. And when I started getting up to those seven, eight, nine miles, I jokingly told a close friend of mine who was a runner that we should do a half marathon together. And so we signed up for the Iowa City oh, half yeah. marathon. Okay. And then he jokingly said we should sign up for a marathon. He goes, we should go all in and complete the full thing. And that was really my, my motive to keep going and pushing. And Okay, well, I can tell you my story then because mine is a little bit similar um, in that um, um, where I had gotten up to five miles and my wife thought I was a runner because 
I told her about the running, but I mean, it was literally like three or four miles every other day or something like that. And so then she's like, oh, there's this uh, half marathon in St. Louis, or I think maybe it was a Drake, uh, the Drake half marathon or something like that. And I was so nervous about looking bad about her because I, this was the person I would end up marrying and, you know, I just really didn't want to fall short. So I actually ran a half marathon without telling her because I thought she was like a super runner and I just did not want to be that person who just, okay, you go on ahead. I just, I just can't do it. And so I ran the BNA trail half marathon in Annapolis, Maryland uh, as my first half marathon. And I remember running at the same pace as the marathoners and they were just having a conversation. They were just talking to each other. They were so relaxed. And in my head, I had always thought that marathon and racing was something that was just a, a, a just an intensity thing. But I actually find, especially as I'm getting a little bit faster, that I'm working really hard to relax, which may sound strange. Um, but that was my first half marathon. And then the next one was, you know, I said, okay, I think I'm, you know, ready for the race. How's your training? She's like, I'm not running it. What do you mean you're not running it? I, I thought we were going to run it together. She's like, no, I just saw you got interested in running. I told you that there was this half marathon. I'm not going to train for this one. I can train for another one, but not this one. And so, uh, but she's like, but look at all the weight you lost. And what I had found was uh, I actually was training in the afternoon, like five or six, and I just wasn't hungry at night. Like, are you hungry right after you run or... No? Not usually. Okay. And, and I just lost a bunch of weight and, and it just worked out by accident. Uh, but then I, I started to become a little bit more intentional about it. Can you tell me a little bit about being relaxed? Because you're running at a very different pace than I do. So I run around, I'm very comfortable around 8 minutes, 8.15 pace for the half marathon. For the full marathon, I'm comfortable somewhere around 9 or 10 minute pace. You're a bit more brisk than that. Tell me a little bit about how you stay relaxed during the marathon. How I stay relaxed is I like to listen to music and that pushes me through or I listen to a podcast and I try to enjoy the scenery around me and yeah. Lake Superior, right? Yeah. Can't beat that. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And so for those of you guys that don't know Grandma's Marathon, it's up in Duluth, uh, Minnesota. Uh, so you go up to Minneapolis and then go two and a half more hours <laughs> up to up to Duluth. Uh, the half marathon, uh, it really, really is nice and cool because uh, we start at 6 a.m. So the bus is loaded from 4.30 to 5. And then we left it uh, to get there for the 6 a.m. run. And then I think, when did the marathon start? Was it at 7.45? 7, 7.45, yeah. And so they wanted most of us to be done uh, so that the marathoners didn't run into, you know, a, a scrabble uh, up in the front with the, the half marathon and so forth. And then there's this really kind of cool thing at the Bayfront Park and so forth. Okay, so tell me a little bit about uh, what it is to, to struggle in the marathon. I had my first marathon I ran was Des Moines. And I remember talking to this guy. I was running sub eight miles. I was feeling really good, like up to mile 13. Like I was like, this is cake. This is fantastic. And then right at mile 14 and a half, I started to feel like a little sick. And not like throw up sick, but sick like, uh-oh, I think I'm done. I think I'm done with my glucose and my glycogen. And it was really weird that I could feel that. But once I got to 16 and 17, I was like, yep, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. And I was starting to eat gummy bears. And I think I even had to have some salt or something like that. And those last three miles were absolutely brutal, kind of limping along. Uh, and so there I was, sub eight, all through the first 13 miles. But then I was easily 10 and a half, 11 for the last two or three miles. Uh, tell me a little bit about pushing through, uh, just like you might need to push through in pharmacy school or push through uh, some kind of difficulty that comes up during residency. So I feel the same way about mile 17, mile 18. It is a mental challenge to try to complete those last eight, nine miles for me. And I try to eat fruit snacks or I eat the real fresh fruit that they offer to try to push through. But it's just trying to get through that last portion so that you can keep going and see the finish line. And you have to keep telling yourself only seven miles left, only six miles left. I've made it this far. I need to finish what I started and just have to be positive about it because if you're, if you're negative, it doesn't 
get you anywhere and literally. makes it worse. <laughs> literally makes it doesn't worse. Do. And let, let's talk a little bit about what you actually get on the side of the Duluth Marathon or the Grandma's Marathon because I think it's one of the be- best staffed half and full marathons you could possibly have. So in general, you might get water at, at, you know, at a minimum. But at almost every stop, it was a water or Gatorade, or I mean, you could have done more than one, and a sponge and ice. And for me, I'm an overheater, so I'm someone that will overheat. So when I see ice, I'm like, oh my gosh, ice, awesome. So I'll get my Powerade, put some ice on. Um, tell me a little bit about recovery, because that's the one thing that I think that uh, really, really we forget in professional school is that actually putting in recoveries, intentional recoveries, and I'll talk a little bit about walking during the marathon. Uh, some people advocate, and I'll, I'll tell you that I did it one time and, and it actually worked, but tell me a little bit about recovery and how you recover, not just from running, uh, but also from the appies. Do you give yourself a little reward? Do you really take the weekend off? Uh, or are you just kind of burning through to Monday? Because I know that you have a job in addition to appies. Uh, tell me a little bit about your recovery process. So I try to run. That's one big thing that I do for myself during appies to keep me going and take my mind off of doing something else besides pharmacy. I manage a pool in the summer, and that's my fun summer job that's separate from pharmacy. So I get away in that sense. I try to get outside as much as I can. I really enjoy doing rag bry and biking. So that's another hobby I like to do. But I think it's really important that you do take the time to recover and give yourself a break so you don't burn out. Even with running, I'm taking a few days off right now before I start training for my next marathon in September. You're doing Omaha, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll stick with Des Moines, even with the hills. Yeah. And that sad, sad like time for like three or four miles around Waterworks Park where there's nobody. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I'll get another month of training. You'll 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 have you'll have all the cheering and, and the no hills. Well, let's talk a little bit about the the breaks that some some marathoners uh, go into. I so I tried this uh, three years ago, I think, and and I really wasn't in shape to run a marathon. So I was like, all right. Well, let me try the walking thing. And the walking thing is to have intentional breaks. And so at every five minutes and nine minutes, I would take a minute break so that I would basically run eight minute miles and then I would be walking for two minutes, which takes you a tenth of a mile. And so you get just a little bit further, a little bit further. And what I found is that I didn't feel that kind of um, terrible pain at the end of a marathon, like I just put everything out there because I, I didn't overuse those muscles, I guess. And so I think in terms of breaks with pharmacy school, are, tell me a little bit about how you've put your appies so that, are your appies set up so they're going to give you a little bit of break for your off blocks, or are you putting them in a position where that's when you're going to be doing your residency interviewing or residency ASHP? Uh, how did you place your off blocks to give you a little bit of break uh, over the appy cycles? So I like to push through and get things completed. So I chose to take my last cycle off, cycle nine. Um, so I'm able to study for the NAPLEX and okay. the MPG, MP, MPJE. Yeah. But. Okay. And only one off block? Only one. We only get one off block. Okay. All right. So, um, and then you guys are allowed to, to do appies beforehand or you're allowed to do electives or something like that at the end of your P3 year, which is a little bit unusual. Um, but uh, an opportunity to kind of do that ahead of time. Okay, so if somebody was in pharmacy school now and saying, you know, I always wanted to, to do maybe a half marathon or something like that. Uh, you mentioned that, that you had started with a friend. Uh, how would you recommend that someone start? So I would start small, just running a few miles at a time and slowly build up. I think it is helpful to have somebody train with you if you're able to because they do really motivate you and keep you on track because you have that person that wants to run with you and complete it together and makes it more fun and enjoyable if you have somebody to support you and motivate you as well and keep you going and somebody you can talk to about. Okay, yeah, all right. And then in terms of your kind of residency application process as you're moving uh, toward it, uh, how are you recovering on the weekend? So you said that, you know, you do some running and 
um, you get away a little bit. Um, how are you setting up for ASHP? Do they give you an extra week or do they give you time off? Uh, how does it work? Or are you not even going to go to the national conference? I didn't know what your plans were. So I would like to do residency if I'm able to locally in the Midwest. So I'm not sure right now if I'm going to go to mid-year for the week, but they do have an extra week built into your rotation. Okay, so a six-week rotation rather than a five. Okay. Yeah, and what I'm hearing, well, I say hearing when I'm reading Reddit, but what I'm hearing is that um, if you would... If you have never done a uh, residency before that may be going as a P1, P2, P3 uh, and exploring those things uh, during the showcase in the second or third hour, they prefer that the P4s are in that first hour of madness or whatever. But they're actually saying that because of the pandemic and because so many programs have developed their own program, that it's actually better and more important for you to make sure to get to the local program. So if you, you know, choose uh, Iowa or Wisconsin or Minnesota or wherever it is, and they have a local program, that's something you definitely want. And I know, I remember, I feel like Michigan was maybe one of the first big ones that said, we're actually not going to ASHP, we're just going to do this in-house. And so that may be your only, only option. And then if you talk about money, I know that you have a background in uh, finance and, and business, but in terms of money and time spent, um, Brandon Dyson, the owner of TLDR Pharmacy, uh, actually didn't go to mid-year, and he knew that Washington, D.C. was his area. And so he went to Georgetown and I think GW and those, those kinds of areas. And if you are geographically centric, that is, you are going to a very specific local geography, uh, that uh, mid-year may not be the best choice. If, however, you're going to go, you know, move about the country, as they say, then, then maybe mid-year is a good choice. But, but no, I, I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. So, okay, so uh, last question. I've asked you a lot of questions. Uh, is there anything that I didn't cover that you feel like would be really good for someone that's trying to get fit uh, that is thinking that I don't have time for exercise. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just <laughs> too stressed and too busy. I think with the stressed and busy, I think it helps you better balance your life. And if you just incorporate even 10, 15 minutes of your day, building that in and seeing that how that affects you, and it really helps my mood and keeps me driven and focused. So I think that if you're interested in trying to get fit or or not interested in it, um, I think if you are truly passionate about running or fitness, you'll make the time and realize that positive benefit that it has for you overall. Yeah, and I, you know, my, my one regret with Wondergrad was a complete misunderstanding. I always thought that when I had, um, when I was in high school, I thought that the athletics were getting in the way of my academics, and I just had this mindset that, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to do athletics. I have to focus on my academics in undergrad. And I found out the hard way that the opposite was true. It was that I had so much consistency and accountability from the coaches and from my teammates that that was actually what allowed me to do well academically. And then uh, after the first semester, I really suffered, and uh, only until I kind of got that peer group back uh, was I really able to, to do that. So, well, thank you yeah. for your tips on the marathon, and thank you for being on the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So again, thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. And again, that residency.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash pre-residency uh, audio course is available to you. Uh, as we talked about, uh, a lot of our training is spread out. And you know, when you're talking about the things that you're going to need for the next appy or the things that you're going to need for residency, uh, easier to take it one bite at a time. And although I have enough content in there, I think it's probably about 12 or 13 hours worth of content. Uh, you could do it in a couple weeks of just commuting back and forth uh, to classes, and uh, I think they would be really valuable for you. So again, if you want to talk to me, TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com, or if you're starting to think about oh, what kind of activities or appies do I want for next year, uh, I do still do some of the virtual appies if I have space. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, we would have to get an agreement between us and your college if uh, yours is not one that I already work with. So, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com or residency.teachable.com. Have a great week.